Gungrave is the brainchild of mangaka Yasuhiro Naitao, the creator of Trigun, and Studio Red Entertainment, the makers of some games I would like to cover on the channel at some point, like Bujinkai and Blood Will Tell. A year after its release, it was adapted into a 26-episode anime by Studio Madhouse, the same people behind the Trigun anime. Naitao's style bleeds from this game. Just looking at it, you can see that this was made by the dude who drew Trigun. It has a lot of the iconography from Trigun that I love, from boxy and angular weapons to tattered jackets and trench coats flowing in the wind, and turning the environments into Swiss cheese from hurricanes of gunfire. This is probably the closest thing we'll get to a Trigun video game since the one that Red Entertainment was also making got cancelled, and the only piece of public footage of the game is this trailer from 2002 at Sega's Game Jam. God, I really would have liked to play that game, it probably would have been pretty cool! In an interview with the game's producer, Toru Kubo, he talked about how the game was inspired by a multitude of things like Robert Rodriguez's Desperado and John Woo films. Something that all of these pieces of media have in common is the destruction of their locations, scenes filled with insert shots of their locales being absolutely annihilated by gunfire. Gungrave converts that into gameplay perfectly with its destructible environments and the fact that your combo meter is kept up and increased by destroying everything in your wake. I love this game's visuals. It's a perfect blend of a few different styles without any kind of aesthetic clashing. From its 3D cutscenes both in-engine and pre-rendered, to the load screens which are probably just concept art but it looks like manga panels, and and the end of mission title cards when you receive your score, which some look like they are hand drawn, but I could be wrong and they were just made in engine. The cutscenes have this stiffness to its animation that I don't know how to put into words, but I find it very appealing. They remind me of what Guilty Gear would eventually adopt for its story mode in Exard and Strive. Our basic premise before we get more in depth with the story later in the video is you play as Beyond the Grave, or Grave for short, and you are an undead man hell-bent on taking down the Syndicate and their new leader, Harry McDowell. Gungrave is one of those games where the story is window dressing to push gameplay forward, but for what is there, it's really enjoyable and serves to further build on the game's stellar vibes. Gungrave is also one of those read the manual type games, where if you want to know what anything is and or means, you have to read it. The one time I cheaped out and not going complete in box. Thankfully, you can find scans for the manual very easily, I'll link to one in the description below. And the game is simple enough and understandable enough that I was able to play through it with no problem without having read it. Gungrave is a corridor third-person shooter with hallways open and wide enough to create shooting galleries in all meaning of the word. In most third-person shooters of the era, you would be moving around while fighting or shooting from cover. Gungrave has more in common with one of those cowboy shootout games you'd see at carnivals. Enemies fly out of the woodwork and line up to try to stop you, only for you to send them flying. You can move while shooting, but you can't sprint while doing it, and movement while shooting is pretty slow. Your name is Beyond the Grave, and your movement reflects that in a very literal sense. You sham around like a walking corpse. Combine this with your shield that regens when not being hit, and just how many hits it can take before breaking dealing damage to your real health bar, the game really incentivizes you to stand your ground and just start blasting. The end of mission rating also scores you more if you are stylish while taking down enemies, and like I mentioned earlier, your combos build from doing damage to the environment. So just play the game like you're in the opening of DMC3 with Dante riding that demon. Your combat options are on the basic side with only a pair of pistols, your coffin as a melee weapon, and demolition shots which were originally called desperado shots earlier in development in reference of the Robert Rodriguez film I mentioned earlier. These consume one ammo each time you use them, and can be refilled by getting enough hits in a combo to replenish the skull meter on the left side of your screen. You only start with the rocket launcher for the first few levels, which is another reference to Desperado, and you get three more over the course of the game, but I'm not really sure when, since I suddenly realized I had access to them at the end of the game, but I'd imagine I got a new one each time I beat a boss. Each boss also has a special demolition shot to finish them off when their health is low and the skull on your HUD is glowing blue. I sure hope you don't have carpal tunnel syndrome because this is a game where your wrists go to die. You're gonna be very familiar with mashing that square button because that is all you do for this entire game. 
For movement options, your best bet is to mix between being stationary, doing sick gun katas, and also using the four-way directional dodge. Sadly, the game doesn't really have any moments where you can dive backward down a flight of stairs while firing into a group of enemies, but that didn't stop me from trying to orchestrate a scenario of that anyways. The biggest thing to wrap your brain around with the controls is when moving grave with the left stick, it is also used to move your camera around. At times, it can be pretty awkward to try to move the camera if dudes are flanking you, since you can only do a 180 degree turn by pressing L2. So there are a few blind spots where enemies can be caught in that would be more manageable if your camera had a slightly faster turn speed. For level design, the game rarely ever evolves past the big open corridors for shooting galleries I mentioned earlier, and when it does, it's often for the worst. The awkward camera controls do not make for good navigation of tight hallways, and where the camera is placed smack dab in the middle of the screen, and how at times it awkwardly orbits grave since he and the camera have to move together, places like the sewer level feel far too claustrophobic to try to see and combat enemies. It's at its worst when you have to round doorways and enemies are on each side of it. Your movement is just too stiff to not get hit, which is probably why you are so tanky. I do want to bring up that the game is very short. It only took me about two hours to get through the whole thing, and a good 30 to 45 minutes was stuck on two of the final bosses. Its short length felt perfect and honestly played towards the game's favor. The length of each stage combined with how simple yet satisfying the combat is, accompanied by this banging soundtrack, always left me feeling full after completing a level. It's like eating a meal that you think going in will leave you hungry, but after finishing it, you realize how oddly filling it was and are left satisfied. That's that's how I felt when I kept going back for footage for certain stages. Every time I hit that score screen, I was just like, ah, that was good. It feels very reminiscent of playing an old arcade game. And if it wasn't already obvious enough from the footage I've shown up until now of this game, it's pretty easy. But it does take a noticeable spike in difficulty for the second and third bosses from the end. Bear Walkins' second form seems to only be hit from this tiny spot where his real body actually is. And all of his attacks are massive, and you are kept at a range where your pistol can't really reach him without running the risk of getting hit by one of his attacks. This boss would be a lot easier if you were far more nimble instead of having the movement of a walking corpse, which, you know, is apt. The Boonji fight is also noticeably harder than all of the others. I seriously felt like I was missing something about this boss fight. I always struggle when he hides behind one of these massive pillars and starts regenning his entire health bar. And when I round the corner to stop him, he just sends me flying and I can't even see what he hits me with due to the camera. The only time I've been able to avoid this is going around the pillar far enough out that I could see him in my peripheral vision. But when doing this, by the time I get into position, he's most likely healed up almost his entire health bar. This is still a sick rival fight regardless, and people in the comments will most likely tell me that I'm missing some facet of this boss that makes it far easier and far more enjoyable. Now, from here on out, I'm going to be talking about the end of the game and the rest of its story, so if you want to go in blind and play the game for yourself and watch the anime, click here to avoid spoilers. Before the start of the final level after beating Bungie, we get a cutscene that explains everything that has happened leading up to this very moment. Graves' name was originally Brandon, and like mentioned earlier in the game, he used to be a part of the Syndicate, before becoming the undead killing machine he is now. The world of Gungrave was cruel and unkind to our cast of characters, and the previous leader of the Syndicate, Big Daddy, wanted to create a world of peace for his daughter and everyone else, and tasked you with helping making that dream a reality. Then, in an elevator later, Harry pitches to you a plot to help him kill the boss, and with the new thing he's got his hands on, you'll both be able to control the entire city. Since you are clearly not on board with Harry's plan, he betrays you by shooting you in the stomach and then in the head, sending you falling down to the streets. Up until the final level of the game, the locations have been fairly grounded. There are still your fantastical elements like Grave himself and the monstrous forms the leaders of the Syndicate take, but the final level is the biggest departure from the standard street locations you've had up until now. Grave rides up an elevator, assumingly the one Harry killed him in, to the tower you've been fighting your way through the entire Syndicate's army to reach, and at the top you are above the clouds. It's like reaching an unnaturally made heaven. The enemies you fight here look like failed experiments of angels being birthed out of these massive floating heart-like cocoons that pulsate like a heartbeat, and the music accompanying this level is perfectly unsettling.
with futuristic stairs that form out of thin air floating on nothing, it's like reaching ending D of Drakengard, and it's absolutely perfect. You confront Harry, and the final boss is Big Daddy, which Harry has turned into a giant blue baby monster hooked up to machinery. And then in phase two, you must fight this gigantic head running down a path that looks like a spine inside of a rib cage. It's absolutely nightmarish, and I love when games completely shift like this in their final act. After you beat your former boss, the game ends on one of my favorite video game gimmicks, where you have to press square to fire the bullet that kills Harry. What the go? Yare o brando. Kondo wa omae no bando. Sa. Gungrave is short, sweet, and the exact type of game when I think about AA, middle-of-the-shelf games from the PlayStation 2 era that is sorely missing in today's market. The story of this game is that perfect middle ground where there's enough left up to your imagination to fill in the blanks, but there is also enough present to tell a simple yet effective story to push the gameplay forward, and can easily be expounded upon in future entries. Copies have gotten pretty pricey on eBay recently, going for around $40 or more, so you're probably better off emulating it since there isn't any way to get the game official off the PSN store, and you'll get around some of the instances of slowdown when there are too many enemies on screen. After getting mixed reviews only sitting at 65 on Metacritic, a sequel would be released two years later under the name of Gungrave Overdose. the biggest piece of dog shit. Okay, that intro was a little more hyperbolic than my actual opinion on the game, but I absolutely do think that this game is a step down from the first one, feeling blatantly unfinished and comes off as a lopsided mess. Being developed by the animation studio who did the cutscenes for the first game, and Red Entertainment only publishing the game this time around, it makes me think that there were some massive issues with this game's development. There is little to no information on this game and what went into its creation, at least in English, but this is one of those games you play and you can just tell from the final product we got that something was off. With what little footage I've shown so far, the graphical downgrades are very apparent. Firstly, the cell shading is gone. Supposedly this was to help the game's performance to prevent slowdown present in the first game, but Overdose still runs like ass, and the only source on this is now a dead linked review that is archived, which has such choice quotes as, Overdose is a straight up shooting game. Don't think this is one of those sissy-fied Final Fantasy adventures that features some dude that's gonna fall in love. They also mentioned how they were given a press copy, so maybe they got this info directly from Red Entertainment, so who knows what to believe and how true this is. The game has horrible image ghosting that makes anything and everything completely incomprehensible. Here is me scrubbing through my footage frame by frame, and there is always something leaving this horrible after image that just muddles the screen. If this wasn't here, the game would look far better, with its character models and color choices reminding me of Mega Man Legends. I went into playing this game under the pretense that this was supposedly a 
vast improvement from the first game, which I really liked. I do not see where these vast improvements are that make people like this game more than the first one. Basically, everything I liked about the first game isn't present here, and if it is, it's in some bastardized manner that didn't fully understand why it was designed the way it was in the first game. That's not to say that this game is completely unsalvageable, far from it. There are plenty of things I like about this game, like the new characters, Rocket Billy Red Cadillac and Junji Kabane. They are a ghost with a guitar and a blind zombie with gun swords. And with some slight changes to the game, I can see how this could be the true successor that the first game deserves. This is why I'm going to come off pretty harsh on this game, because it shows the potential but flounders it horribly. It has only made me appreciate the first game more and more for how much it got right on its first try, while well, this game feels like it spends its entire runtime trying to mend the mistakes of the original. The most prominent being the game's length and pacing. Every review for the first game, mine included, talks about the original's hour and a half to two hour runtime. In my case, it was positive, but for most of them listed on Metacritic, this was in a negative light. So Overdose aimed to rectify this by now being six to seven hours long and has three playable characters. But they didn't increase the game's length in any interesting way. It just bloats the runtime by making levels go on forever. It ruins the immaculate pacing of the first game at every chance it gets. In the original, you breeze through levels, always marching forward like an unstoppable wrecking ball. But in this game, you are constantly stopped and forced to fight endless waves of the same mook spawning in for minutes at a time, and it just gets so boring. Or end up being trapped in a section that seems like one of those endless wave battles, because the game gives no indication that you need to destroy things in the environment to continue on, like the casino level, where I didn't realize one of the blackjack tables weren't destroyed in the corner of the room behind some slot machines, and I needed to break all of them to progress. So I sat in the room for six minutes fighting the same waves of guys over and over again as they ran at me from the other side of the room until I didn't have a shadow of a doubt that there had to be something else to progress. Two levels earlier, I ran into a bug where I wasn't able to progress because the door that was supposed to spawn more enemies and allow me to walk through it didn't open, and I had to exit out to the main menu and restart the mission in order to progress. So initially, I thought it may have been another instance like that. The weirdest thing about this section is that the level before this had an indicator to destroy something in the environment so you could continue forward. And you are only at this casino to get information from its manager, so there isn't any real reason the player should think that they need to destroy everything in their path to make progress. In my review for the first game, I mentioned how there was no tutorial and that you had to read the manual to know what to do. This game fixes that by having one, but goes in the complete opposite direction to the point of parody. The first level of this game is literally Ego Raptor's roll calling you to give you tutorial gags. Every five feet you are stopped to be called by Mika on the radio to tell you how to do something and it grinds the game to a complete halt. Grave, can you read me? I'll be giving you radio support. I'll do what I can to help. Lock- <laughs> Change lock target. For close range attack. Your coffin attack. Then, for the rest of the game, the cast calls you over the radio to tell you pointless nonsense or something that you can see happening right in front of you. You can turn off the radio and tutorials in the settings on the main menu, but this isn't actually a good solution. You shouldn't have to punish yourself by not learning the game's mechanics because the game does a terrible job at teaching you them. Also, on your first playthrough, it's not like you were gonna know if anything important is gonna be told to you over the radio, so most people wouldn't run the risk of turning it off in the chance you miss something important. This issue of pacing is also spread to its story, where the game can spend 15 minutes between cutscenes and not actually tell you anything of value. Conversations will drone on and on and be utter fluff, in failed attempts to characterize our cast of characters, but it always falls flat mainly because everyone feels so two-dimensional. I said in my review of the first game that it had that perfect middle ground of having enough story so you can get an idea of what's happening, but also enough is left open to interpretation that your mind fills in the gaps. Overdose does not stop talking and trying to tell you story. It has zero restraint and has none of the mysticism or vibes of the original. The first game felt like a three-part OVA from the 80s that you never heard of, while Overdose feels like a 52-episode anime that should have been half its length that came out in the 2000s. The game would have been better off showing and not telling you all of these things, but that's where the biggest feeling of rushed and incomplete game is. In the first game, there was a decent amount of cutscenes that, even if there wasn't dialogue, characterized Grave and the
the game's world. Most of this game's story is told via visual novel cutscenes. To this game's credit, they do try to animate them to convey what's supposed to be happening so you can visualize it in your head. And it does work to an extent, but they'd be better off actually animating these cutscenes or not being in the game at all when what we got is low audio quality, poorly mixed, repetitive, awkward dialogue with voice acting that never matches the intensity of the text on screen or the animations happening, with portraits of the characters shifting between their four drawn poses shaking all over the screen like this is some Ransona video. Juji is one note for practically the entire game, and once you get an explanation at the end why he is like this, it doesn't feel justified for wasting my time. I understand why he repeats the same gimmicky lines over and over, but that doesn't make the fact that's all he says any better. Most of the time when he talks, his sentences start with this sound effect. Stuff it, you little brat. Listen, I'm serious here. Quiet. Don't give me orders. We got the information we needed. I don't know what the game is trying to convey. It's like if every conversation he had started with the Vine boom sound effect, and it's awful. For some reason, if you save at these between stage screens and don't view the briefing, if this is where you stop to take a break and turn the game off, when you come back to play the game and hit continue, it just loads you right into the next level, so I ended up missing a few briefings telling me what the plan was. Story and its pacing is only one of the many facets of this game that I find unsatisfying. Let's turn our focus onto the gameplay. The original Gungrave felt like a classic arcade game that you never heard of ported to consoles. It was short, sweet, and simplistic. It's big biggest comparable comparison of the time were the Hideki Kamiya directed PS2 classics Devil May Cry and Beautiful Joe, though I would say those games have more replay value due to how much readily apparent depth there is to them. But that's the thing, the original Gungrave was not fun and enjoyable in spite of its short length, it was because of it. It was a main factor that contributed to that enjoyment. If the game was the same as it is now, but simply longer, it would not have been a better game. It would be a far worse game, because it would just get repetitive and boring since the game does not have the mechanical depth nor does it have the gameplay variety to keep people invested. It did its thing and finished before it can get the chance to become old. But nonetheless, this game aimed to remedy the single sitting playtime critique by adding new features to gameplay, and some of them are actually really cool. Your coffin has more combos instead of being a single slow swing only used when enemies are too close to deal with them, or caught in one of your blind spots since you turn like a fridge weighed down by cinder blocks. You are now able to parry rockets back at their senders with a coffin along with using it as a shield. It does bother me how weightless it feels now, and how in most encounters the best thing to do when there's a lot of rocket enemies is just stand still and spin the thing around your neck like a hula hoop. Speaking of weightless, that word can be applied to combat as a whole. It's much faster now with your run speed from the first game being your default speed here, and you no longer slow down when firing, but Grave still moves around like a walking tank, so all that speed increase really does is just make your actions feel like there's less impact and give the game an overall slippery feeling like you're on an ice level in a platformer, rather than actually making you feel more nimble. The camera is that early 2000s Japanese action game one that Ninja Gaiden Black also used that I absolutely despise. It's the one where not only is it inverted with no way to change it, it's very slow, swivels in a weird way, and resets the camera to directly behind you when you let go of the stick, rendering it utterly pointless. The only thing it's good for is to disorient the player and make you motion sick. Turning grave in the camera is still all tied to the left stick, so I never found a reason to ever actually use this. The flow of combat feels faster now, with enemies being quicker, running around you more, and regularly trying to flank and surround you, rather than lining up for a duel like in a western. Combine this with the terrible controls, your shield now being made of paper, only recharging when out of combat, even if you're not being hit when in combat, and the recharge randomly cancelling once you enter combat even if you haven't been hit yet, and the game taking forever to register what constitutes out of combat to recharge, I do not know why they would make these changes to the shield when it worked great in the first game. You can be in the middle of combat peppering enemies from a distance without aggroing them and not having a single bullet fly in your direction, and the shield bar will not recharge. It's baffling, and as a result your shield is hardly ever going to be fully charged unless you stop and wait 20 seconds for it to start the recharge, which is also slow, or you will be taking damage to your real health bar a lot. Your first time through the game you aren't going to know where area transitions are, so if you're moving ahead 
head after beating a bunch of enemies, control can just be taken away from you forcing you into another fight when you have one fourth shield. So this is just another thing added to create the unfun start and stop gameplay of this game. The auto aim and gun grave overdose is the second worst I've ever seen right behind Dino Crisis 3. In the first game, you could stand your ground and mow down a battalion of dudes lined up to stop you. You just had to point in their general direction and the auto aim would do the rest. Now, if you try to do the same thing, guns fire off in random directions or get fixated on random shit in the environment. This renders your gun kata barrage practically useless, meaning you have to lock on and it's the second worst lock on I've ever seen, only being beaten out by Dino Crisis 3 again. The damn thing just doesn't work. It has the most inconsistent range I've ever seen. You can be right in front of a guy and it simply doesn't do anything when you press the button. Then other times it will lock onto a dude in the back of the room barely rendered in by the draw distance. When it does work, the slightest thing makes the lock on break, completely defeating the purpose of it. It doesn't auto snap to new enemies in your cone of vision next to your target when they die. And when most enemies die in two to three taps and it can take 10 to 15 presses of the R1 button to lock on, all this did was make my level of frustration rise will my desire to play this game decrease. The game introduces some new enemy types to try and spice up gameplay like these melee dudes that block your bullets and these rocket launcher dudes that carry small shields, but in reality you don't need to change your approach to gameplay if you don't want to, since you can still just brute force past their defenses and gun them down from a distance. This was the character you had to be called over the radio to say, WATCH OUT GRAVE! THIS IS THE ENEMY THAT CAN BLOCK YOUR BULLETS, SO YOU GOTTA GET UP REAL CLOSE AND DEAL WITH THEM! Outside of the tutorial, it feels like all the levels were designed like the worst one from the first game. So many cramped and narrow hallways that the camera is simply too shit to deal with, where you are constantly blindsided and shot in the ass, completely depleting your shields. So to get it back, you either need to stand still after you dealt with everybody and let it slowly recharge, waste a demolition shot since they recharge some of your shield, or just take damage and needlessly lose your HP. The camera also shakes like it has Parkinson's, so combine this with the image ghosting I mentioned at the start, it leaves you with unintelligible screens like this. The camera also has a habit of locking on and following random enemies flying in the air or passing by you against your will. Whenever the game did this, I just ended up getting hit by a rocket I couldn't see coming, or get stun locked in a corner where the camera would freak out. The camera in this game is appalling, but again, it isn't as bad as Dino Crisis 3, so I guess that's something. After about an hour into the game, the signs of cutting corners starts to show, at least in a way that doesn't feel like you can ignore it. Firstly, there seems to be no unique demolition shots for bosses. If there is, I didn't get them or notice an indicator to do so. Then you go to Chinatown to interrogate this guy for information. Instead of what feels like it should have been a level, you just get to stare at a JPEG with speed lines on it while it shakes and flashes with the occasional sound effect and terrible voice grunts for 45 seconds. The level probably would have sucked, so I guess I should be thanking the game for saving me some time. Then near the end of the game, your team is cornered by one of the big bads, Fango Ram, and Billy buys time for everyone to escape. This is a big moment that should have been animated in one of the very nicely done pre-rendered cutscenes. Instead, it's the same thing with just a JPEG that shakes with some sound effects, making the moment completely fall flat. Hell, maybe the boring dialogue would have been more tolerable or interesting if it wasn't told to you in these out-of-place visual novel animatics. A bunch of sections in this game feel like they weren't made with Graves' movement in mind, almost like they were for a game that controlled completely different, that also had a far better camera and lock-on system. You fight these front loaders, and it's like pulling teeth since you can't damage them from the front, meaning you have to hit them from the sides or back. And like I already covered, your auto-aim is terrible, so you can't rely on that. The lock-on for some reason only likes to target the shovel of the front loader that doesn't take any damage. Firing when locked on is also the slowest rate of fire in the game, so even if you manage to lock onto a part that you can damage, you aren't getting many shots off before it turns and rams you. Grave somehow has stiffer movement than a tread-based construction site vehicle, so aiming for its sides feels awkward as hell, not to mention it's also far faster than you, so you can't get good consistent damage off leading to this fight taking forever. Like any great boss fight that I love, it spawns in endless droves of basic enemies that distract you from fighting the thing that grants you progress. The arena is too small to fight these giant things and maneuver your tumble dryer body, it's very easy to get corner trapped by them and just be stun locked until you die. Hell, it doesn't even need to be a corner, you can just be slammed against the wall over and over again until you die. 
with the front loader and random mobs blocking your path from escaping. Eventually, I realized the best method to deal damage is to do the left and right dive roll since it's the fastest barrage of bullets and from my experience is the most reliable accuracy wise. This is then how I played the rest of the game and how I would approach future bosses because otherwise it takes way too long. Then there is the spider tank fight that is also miserable. I don't know how you're supposed to ever deal consistent damage to this when this thing has a minigun that shreds your shield instantly. It fires forever and when it isn't, it just climbs on the walls and runs in circles which breaks your lock on. And it has a faster speed of doing this while firing the minigun. And for an extra serving of fuck you, after beating the first one, you have to fight two of them at the same time. There is an elevator section like the one in Resident Evil 2 that seriously had me contemplating dropping the game because it's fucking annoying as hell. Like all the other fights I've complained about, the arena is too fucking small for how many enemies drop in. This is where the camera is the most unresponsive and just does its own thing, following the hover cars passing by while I get slammed into an invisible wall. And the thing that bothers me the most about all these three fights I just mentioned, when I beat them, I didn't do anything different. I played the exact same way and simply got lucky with RNG that they didn't spam moves that I had no way to respond to, or in the case of the elevator, spawn in so many dudes that I melted instantly. There was one attempt versus the duo of spider tanks where they didn't stop firing their miniguns and I didn't know what to do since I had no way to deal damage without losing half of my health, so just fuck me, I guess. Then you have a horrible level where you have to fight your way down an airfield strip and fight waves of large enemies, tanks, and multiple helicopters. And as you'd expect, fighting the helicopters takes 10 fucking years since the game refuses to lock onto them, and when it does, it's easily broken, and you can hit it for a max of maybe four times before it flies away out of your range or right out of the map. Why did they make you fight an enemy in a game where your range is inconsistent shit? Why did they make it so you have to fight multiple? One was bad enough, and my heart just sank when I started seeing the second one flying in from the edge of the draw distance. But then, the unexpected happened. The game actually became fun. Six hours in, I finally got to a point where I kept saying, where the hell was this game the entire time? Starting off with a rematch with Boonji that ends with what feels like a unique demolition shot from the first game, then you have a fight with a lady whose name I can't remember if the game even told us, and the fight is like a prototype Jean fight from Bayonetta if Kamiya suffered blunt force trauma to his head when making it. There were some instances where the camera freaked out and I couldn't tell what she was actually doing, but I was so happy I wasn't fighting the fucking helicopters anymore I didn't really care. It felt like I finally reached the real game. This final level felt like it was the game they wanted to make. It had me wondering why the hell they didn't spread these interesting bosses out for my 7 hour playthrough instead of loading all the cool fights in the last hour or so while I spent three-fourths of the game fighting boring stupid shit like forklifts, front loaders, tanks, and helicopters. The first game had the same structure of No More Heroes, where it essentially is a game of boss rushes, with you having to fight your way through small levels first to get to them. The weirdest thing is that pretty early on there is a shot of a silhouetted lineup of all the bad guys, and the same one is even in the opening. But then they're all at the very end of the game in the final level outside of one which is at the second to last level. Peppering them throughout the game would have made it far more enjoyable and interesting because you then wouldn't be fighting these terrible vehicle bosses like it's Devil May Cry 2. But this enjoyment was short-lived, only lasting about 30 minutes or 45 if I'm being very generous. The Fangaram fight starts off very cool, but it quickly devolves in the second phase of him just summoning these metal cobs of corn that trap you in place, and I ended up just standing still and spamming my melee to build up combo meter to refill my demolition shot and just spammed those one after another until he fell over. Then there is this terrible platforming section which made me want to strangle whoever designed this. You could only make it to the platform in front of you by diving forward, and if you don't jump from the position the game wants you to, even if it looks like you should make the gap, you will just slide down right in front of it like you hit an invisible wall. Not to mention when you get in front of each platform, enemies spawn on the one in front of you. And at the bottom floor, if you fuck up the platforming, that level is filled with suicide bombers. And worst of all, all of these enemies that spawn in on those platforms respawn every time if you fail. And they didn't despawn the ones that happened your previous attempt. So the room quickly becomes overpopulated to the point you can't easily deal with them and makes the game run like shit, which makes the platforming even harder. Why the fuck was there a singular platforming room at the very end 
of this shitty corridor shooter. Who the fuck thought this was cool? Then you get to the final boss and it's just fucking confusing. Phase 1, it's a dude playing a church organ from outer space given to him by aliens. To damage him so you can start phase 2, you need to destroy these three shield generator things to take out the main shield protecting him. Each of them also has a shield powered by these three floating crystals. During the fight, Grave goes Super Saiyan so your demolition shots permanently refill. Where the confusion happened with me that ended up dragging this fight out forever is that I broke the the pink crystal first and attempted to destroy its corresponding generator, blue mirrors then spawned in front of it when I shot at it and knocked me down. They're kind of the same shade of blue as the blue crystal, so I thought, oh, I have to destroy the blue crystal too in order to damage the other generators. This must mean that each crystal has a unique attack, because for some ungodly reason, the boss has an attack that will tint the screen green and slow you down. It's like being on the opposite side of one of your demolition shots Day of the Dead. This attack makes this one of the worst bosses I've ever fought, because you get knocked down or simply try to follow the flying crystals to deal damage to them, and it's the slowest thing ever. You thought getting stunlocked by the front loaders were bad, imagine having to get up each time at 25% speed, only to be knocked down again because you can't move to dodge. And you can see this next attack flying right at you in slow motion. It's like being trapped in a horrible nightmare where you're trying to fight back against a bully, but your arms are noodles. You can kinda counteract this by using multiple day of the deads, the solution to actually beat this fight is to spam demolition shots on the generators until they explode, but because of the green slowdown attack, it never dawned on me that this is what I had to do since I was wasting all my demolition shots preventing the game from running like a slideshow. Ultimately, the reason this fight took so long was my fault, but this game does a terrible job at conveying anything, and as a result, it made me take away all the wrong lessons, which is probably something interesting to look at and dissect from a game dev standpoint. Now, Grave isn't the only playable character this game has to offer. Rocket Billy and Junji are playable after beating the game once as Grave. I was hoping their levels would be from their perspective as Grave progressed through them simultaneously, since you can hear them doing stuff in the background over the radio in tandem to you when you're playing through these levels. Unfortunately, it's the same exact levels fighting the same exact bosses, at least for as much as I saw, because I lost interest after getting halfway through the game as Junji, and it only had surface level fluff being different like radio chatter. If there's anything different at the end, the first half didn't hold my attention enough to warrant me going through the miserable level design over and over again to find out. Hey, it's Civit from post-production. I decided to go and check to see if there was anything unique near the end of the game, and sure enough, there was. But like I said in the main script, it isn't actually worth your time to go and check out. All it is is a few new pieces of dialogue against the late game bosses, which as someone who did not find the story interesting or engaging at all, I couldn't care less. There there is a few cool demolition shot like finishers against the other bosses like Boonji and the Bayonetta styled boss whose name I think was Sherry. The only other funny thing of note is that during the Super Saiyan section is Grave, instead for Billy he's just shirtless. So everything I said before this cut-in and after this cut-in completely still stands that it isn't worth your time to play through the campaign two more times to see these things. I was hoping at least in level 1, instead of fighting the hotel manager, you would have a fight versus Grave, since he beats the manager before the duo reaches him. Instead, you just have the same fight, and the cutscene then doesn't make any sense, because in this scenario, you got there first. Their gameplay is at least different from Graves that warrants some time to be put in to check it out. Demolition shots are the same with new animations to match the characters' gimmicks and aesthetics, but there was a massive oversight with these two characters. Since Grave doesn't speak, he doesn't have any combat bad barks when fighting. These two characters do not stop repeating the same two lines over and over again through your entire playthrough, which is the biggest de-incentivizer to make me ever want to play them. Juji's sword sounds like one of those foam nerf swords flailing through the wind, which in turn makes his melee attacks feel kind of limp, but the entire game has lackluster sound design and audio quality, so it shouldn't be all that surprising, but the other characters you unlock later sound bad too. It's a shame, since he is more focused around melee combat combat with his dual-wielded gun swords. For example, the charge shot added to Grave's guns in this game is instead on his swords, and when you fully charge it, you let out a barrage of projectile sword slashes that clear most rooms. But of course, I noticed something that ruined this cool thing for me too, which is if you use the quick turn button, it cancels these charged attacks, meaning that you could only do it in the direction you start in. So if you clear out the room in front of you and you still have enemies behind you, since they love to flank in this game, you'll have to cancel the attack early or run 
run the risk of getting shot in the ass and needlessly dying. Dodging to the sides while firing still proves to be the fastest way to deal damage, at least from my perspective, and the auto-aim is still terrible and shoots at random things, so at least there is some level of consistency in this game. The front loader fight was actually much easier this time, since Juji's melee attacks are so fast you could easily deal with the front loader turning to try and block your attacks with the shovel. Parts that I struggled on as Grave felt like they were actually made for this character, at least enough to abuse the shitty aspects of this game for my own advantage. But then you get to parts that feel like they were made with Grave in mind, and the cycle of misery starts all over again. Getting to the part in the casino where the rooms are filled with slot machines that secretly have machine guns in them had me come to a horrible realization that there are sections in this game where your guns and their range is needed, at least to some extent. I have no concrete proof that Juji's guns are weaker than Grave's other than it taking longer to destroy the same slot machines, and while doing this testing I was struck with a that's so raven visage of horror like a Vietnam flashback to fighting the helicopters as Grave and how miserable they were. They were already enough of a pain in the ass fighting them as a dude whose main combat gimmick is guns. Now I would eventually have to fight them with a dude who's melee focused. Nonetheless, I trucked on until mostly through stage 4 where I just wasn't having fun anymore playing as Juji, with the thought of the helicopter fight in mind with a few other sections still being unenjoyable even as Juji, I decided to stop playing. I'm someone who does find enjoyment from rather shallow PS2 era third person melee action games, but usually only if other aspects of the game make up for the lackluster combat depth. Like for example, I would love to cover the Raido Kuzanoha games at some point, because while they have some rather meh melee combat, there are other things about the game that I think are very cool and worth talking about, but unlike Devil Summoner 1 and 2, this game does not contain anything that keeps me wanting to play. Rocket Billy Red Cadillac is the third playable character for this game, and he almost actually saves it. He was exactly the thing missing from this game that really makes it stand out. He's goofy, weird, and has an unconventional weapon despite its approach to gameplay being the same as the other two in reality. Billy is just so fun to fuck around with, jamming out on his guitar while electrifying dudes from a distance. The auto-aim seems to actually function with this character, which is a godsend. It's really fun to jump around like you're an 80s rock star at a concert while while murdering tons of dudes, then doing a little jig while your ghost guitar spins around you to parry rockets back at enemies. He plays like if Nevin in DMC3 didn't require 400 IQ to use in a way that looks cool. Unfortunately, like I alluded to at the start of this paragraph, Billy himself isn't enough to carry this game, especially when you're playing through the same levels again for the third time, at least from what I saw until I made the executive decision that it would be a better use of my time to just cut the game short so I can work on this video and move move on to others. Part of me does feel bad that I didn't play through their whole sections, just to see if something is different. But a few years ago, I made a change to my life that I feel like I was better off for. I stopped caring about things I didn't enjoy. If I wasn't having fun, or at least consuming something where my unenjoyment felt like it was part of the point and I was buying into that notion, I stopped playing, watching, or reading it. I no longer saw those pieces of media through to the bitter end, kicking and screaming, miserable the whole time, just because some part of my life lizard brain needed to see things through to the end. It's why I stopped watching shows like The Walking Dead, because season after season of watching it with a friend despite neither of us liking it anymore, and hadn't liked it since really the first season, it was just a better use of our time doing something we actually found fulfilling. I see nothing to gain from playing through this game I didn't enjoy for a second and third time, just so I can fight two bosses at the end that I found enjoyable. Gungrave Overdose isn't complete trash, but the bad outweighs the good in my opinion. It extended its runtime, but not in any interesting way. While my playthrough as Grave was only roughly over seven and a half hours, it honestly felt like 20 because every aspect of this game feels like an utter slog to go through. It has a lot of aspects that I assume are there for the sake of difficulty, but they just come off as annoying and frustrating rather than actually posing a challenge. It lost the first game's style and finesse, which makes it feel clunky, rushed, and straight up unfinished in areas. If you do want to play this game, just emulate it. It launched back in 2004 at $15, so paying more than 10 physically for this is probably a scam. I'd honestly say the game was worth maybe 5 at most if I was generous, but I don't think you'll find anyone selling it at that price. All we can do now is hope that Gungrave Gore learns from the mistakes of this game and sticks more to the first game's arcadey nature. It looks very promising, and I can't wait to cover it next year.
After the disaster that was Gungrave Overdose in 2004, the Gungrave IP became dormant outside of the anime in 2006. It wouldn't be until 13 years later in 2017 did Grave make his return to the world of video games, and honestly, I wish he hadn't. For context, compared to my other multi-game reviews where I covered things in chronological order, this is the last game that I played and made a segment for this video. So with the knowledge of what Gungrave Gore is like, and with what I'm about to say about this game, A, I can't believe they got a chance to make Gore after how bad this game is, and B, I can't believe how good Gungrave Gore is when this is all they had made before it, besides a World War II plain dogfighter battle royale with two reviews on Steam. The ever present question about this game that you'll be screaming during your entire playthrough is, why is this a VR game and not a third-person shooter with gyro controls? Nothing about this justifies the VR headset. It's a complete gimmick and just gives VR a bad look. Originally, Iggy Mob was going to make a Gungrave mobile game under their Project Polaris initiative, but that plan fell through. This is just going to be a review for the game. If you want more history on Iggy Mob, I recommend watching this video on the studio and Gungrave Gore. You know, after finishing watching my video, of course. I do feel bad for how much I'm about to shit on this game, since the studio is really passionate about the Gungrave IP, and they are a studio from an area where console development isn't really a thing. I want Iggy Mob to do good, succeed, and make good games, but Gungrave VR is not it. This is supposed to be a prequel to Gungrave Gore, but the story here is non-existent. The biggest turnoff about this game is how it controls and how you aim. In most VR games, at least from the ones that I've experienced, Experienced, you use the two motion controllers to interact with the menus via pointing at them. In this game, you have to aim with your head and look around using the headset while using the PlayStation 4 controller to play the game. Your VR headset controllers do not work, other console controllers do not work, anything else either didn't register or worked for a few seconds before the game crashed for me. The game feels like it's held together with graham crackers and glue. I'd like you to imagine a third-person shooter with enemies rushing at you. Now I would like you to imagine what it would be like to aim in this game with a 5 pound VR headset tightly strapped to you. Despite the game being only roughly 40 minutes to an hour long, it took me multiple recording sessions over the span of two days because the game kept making me violently ill and left me with my neck hurting for the next couple of days. The camera somehow always managed to find itself being in an awkward orientation to Grave's body. While the recordings are slightly more zoomed in than what I actually saw in the headset, it is still just as awkward looking as this. The health bar was often completely obscured unless I was looking down. They somehow adapted the stiff camera of the original game to VR for maximum sickness, and I have to applaud them for that one. Movement somehow feels stiffer and way worse than the original game. Hit feedback is non-existent. Your dodge still gets you hit, so it makes fighting enemies like this red shogun mech completely annoying. Instead of being able to fire forever like in the previous two games, your guns for some reason overheat, so to cool them down you have to functionally reload them. This constantly gets in the way of fighting enemies that are just bum rushing you, which is probably why this game has a slowdown mechanic. There are also the first person segments where you still move your head around to aim, but now you have arms to swing around like a shitty beer hat. The first level feels way less sickening because this segment is on rails, so you're not moving your head around nearly as much as you do in the third person levels or the second first person level where you're riding the hover bike, which is by far the worst part of this game because not only does it lag, there is tons of pop in, and the blimp you're trying to shoot down has this one missile attack which has you shaking your head left and right to shoot incoming missiles coming at you from all sides. This level is incredibly disorienting and I had to go lay down after beating it because that's how ill it made me. Post mission menus kept appearing in weird spots, and no matter how much I reoriented the VR headset in the settings, I'd have to look in the most awkward angles to see it, and I accidentally restarted the mission I just beat a few times because each menu option is tied to a single button and not your cursor interacting with them, with X being the next mission and A restarting them instead of the other way around. The only praiseable thing in this game is some of the animations are really nice, specifically the demolition shots, and I love these post-mission complete 
animations, they look really good and I love the color choices for them. Despite being 40 minutes long and only having 5 missions, only 5% of people who bought this actually completed it. And after you beat the final boss, which is of course my favorite design trope, a giant enemy in front of a ledge with a million HP that you have to fight for 5 fucking minutes straight, the game tells you that the story will continue in Gungrave VRUN, which was another $10 separate purchase. Gungrave VR UN is basically a DLC to the original Gungrave VR. You can buy both of them in a bundle on Steam for $30, but the game is listed as a separate entry in your library. It too is 40 minutes long and not very good. It's better than the base game because the third person segments are in small areas like this warehouse, so you don't have to move your head around nearly as much. The big difference here is that instead of the first person segments, they decided that half of this game was going to be a side scroller, where you had to look up and down to aim based on this red line. This is by far the weirdest thing that I've seen being based around for a VR game. To aim at the floor, you have to be looking at your crotch, and to aim at the enemies hanging from the ceiling on catwalks above you, or are the giant enemies in front of a ledge, then you need to be looking up at your ceiling. You can look further down the hallways, left or right, at the snipers that are off screen, or the fat bastards that are body slamming you by jumping through the air like a ballerina, by turning your head so your chin is touching your shoulder. Then there is this one segment where you have to play in first person again, falling down a sewer pipe with laser grids that you have to dodge by swaying your body left and right, as if you are one of your parents playing video games for the first time. I've made it abundantly clear that these games are massively motion sickness inducing because you are swinging your head around with a headset tightly strapped to it. Now imagine having to do that while also having to sway left and right at 45 degree angles so you can dodge these lasers. The sound kept breaking throughout both of these games, but this one straight up just didn't play any music, so I saved mentioning it for here. I seriously thought that this game just didn't have any music at all, until consulting someone else's let's play to hear it for myself. Other than the animation at the end, which was neat, there isn't anything else to say about this game. It's just as short, it's just as underwhelming gameplay wise, it's just as unfun to play. While it did cause more neck pain, I will say compared to the base game, it is far less headache inducing, so I guess that's something going for it. Even if you have a VR headset or at least access to one, these two games are not worth trying, even if you could get them for free, let alone the $30 price tag or however much it is when it's on sale. The Gungrave Sweep is real! I cannot believe I finally have my hands on this game. It is a real game that exists. You can go to the store and spend money buying it. How did this happen? Who actually allowed this game to be made because other than people like me, who do they exactly plan to sell this to to make a profit? I do not even know how to review or quantify a game like this. On one hand, part of me wants to look past all of its flaws and be happy that we got a game that is so unabashedly feeling like it came out in 2004. But on the other hand, this game is riddled with lack of polish, so woefully under budget and feels like it is blatantly incomplete. It's so jank, but it has soul. It's shit, but I love it. It makes me want to snap the disc in half, but I can't stop playing it. I got pretty much exactly what I wanted from this game, so I walked away satisfied. I've been saying for months that I fully expected this game to come out and get bashed by general audiences and critics for what it is, and I can understand where they're coming from. For someone who is not a fan of the first game, I don't think there is much here for you. It's one of the many reasons 
reasons I find trying to judge a game like this so hard, because while it's incredibly faithful, it's hard to justify the $50 price tag. It's unabashedly trying to replicate the magic of the first game to a fault, which will alienate the average player. This is what makes the game's existence such an oddity. Obviously, it's a game that is catered to me and my tastes, so I'm happy, but from an objective business standpoint, Gungrave Gore is the anti-focus test game. This game lacks everything you'd see put into a modern release to keep it in line with what average consumers' expectations are. Outside of arguably runtime and progression, it truly feels like a game that fell out of time, released with a somewhat modern coat of paint. This does not excuse the massive amount of jank and downright infuriating design though. The game is clearly low budget, made with Cheeto dust in a dream, which does make me want to go easy on it. It's from a small, practically unknown Korean developer whose only other releases are the Gungrave VR game from a few years ago and a World War II plain dogfighter battle royale that has three reviews on Steam. Even with its low budget nature, I find its lack of options like remappable control schemes and other basic features present in the first game that came out 20 years ago unacceptable. It honestly feels like we are regressing here, where new games come out with less options that should be basic features in a full release. The fact you can't remap the controls unless you're playing on a keyboard for the PC version while moving shoot from square to the right trigger is baffling. I joked about how Gungrave was a game where your wrists go to die in my review for the first game, but at least it had an auto option where you can just hold down the button and it wasn't on the most jagged edged controller trigger on the market. I could not play this game in long bursts because it would leave me with serious wrist pain which I was already suffering from recently. The only time you get to hold down the trigger is when you do the iconic gun katas which requires you to mash RT four times to initiate. The game's Twitter account has joked about this and talked about a patch coming so I fully expect at least the auto option to be added to the game. I predict a bunch of shit I'm going to say in this review to be changed to some degree with patches. This makes me incredibly frustrated since it feels like I am wasting my time and have to keep adding disclaimers to my videos because they inevitably become out of date. Hopefully some of the stuff I'm going to complain about gets changed because it seriously is holding this game back. Who could have predicted that after writing this and going to bed, I would wake up the next morning a few hours later and see that they announced the 1.0 patch that basically addressed everything I planned to complain about. While this is great for the game, this isn't the one I initially played, so I plan to leave what I wrote in, but I will clarify what actually got patched. You'll be able to tell what gameplay is pre and post patch in this video by seeing what costume I am playing with. All the post patch footage will be using the pre-order bonus costumes which didn't actually ship with the game requiring me to email the publisher days later to get them, only when I found out from a Reddit post when looking up how to get my code from Best Buy. There is actually a decent amount of changes and new features present in this game compared to the previous two, and almost all of them are great and for the better. The camera is much better in Gungrave Gore, as it is no longer tied to Grave's back, and actually makes use of the right stick like a normal third-person shooter. You have a new move called Storm Barrage, which allows you to mash triangle to fire bullets all around you once you get 50 hits on your combo. This move looks so cool and I instantly fell in love with it and tried to use it whenever I can, but I came to the realization that unless the enemies are right on top of you, it's incredibly inaccurate, only really firing to your sides and in a V shape from where you are facing. The 50 beat requirement actually comes up a lot, which makes me wish it was just a regular move that you have access to at all times. There are so many situations where it would be really useful, but you can't make use of it since there is no way to keep your combo going as you make your way through the levels, or you are stun locked until your combo drops, or the level starts and you are already being assaulted by a million dudes. This has been slightly remedied after the patch where as long as you have your shield, you won't get staggered from enemies while doing this attack. Like I mentioned earlier, your gun contests have been moved to the new burst mode activated by pressing RT four times. I really wish that doing anything else didn't cancel this and instead just picked it back up if you were holding down RT or pressed and held it again after doing a roll to dodge an incoming attack or striking back incoming missiles. It would drastically improve the fluidity of combat, which has a lot of stiff quirks to it that really brings the jankness of this game to the forefront. The auto function added in the first patch does somewhat do this by instantly activating burst mode while standing still if auto is turned on. I'm really glad that they made auto an option that you can toggle on the d-pad so it does not end up being like Gungrave Overdose where you lose access to your charge shot since the only place you could change this auto option is in the main menu. In the third patch of the game they added the ability to do your charge shot while jumping and while doing your roll. This patch also made it so your charge shot fires more but the 
trade-off is that it takes longer to charge than the original version. I don't really like this change. The new shots feel like they have no impact, leaving you just standing there taking fire from enemies who are not reacting to being hit by you at all. And the new charge shot takes so much longer to fire that it just feels really awkward as is. I think a great fix for this would be to allow you to do the normal charge shot like you could do in the original version of this game, but also charge it longer to make it fire like it is now. This way it's the best of both worlds, but even if they don't change it, at least you can cancel out of the move now, so if it isn't doing anything for you, you aren't animation locked and stuck doing this super limp move. It also added a reticle so you can tell who the game is targeting, along with the ability to aim down sights, so you can overwrite the game's reticle and choose your own targets. The soft lock in this game is leagues better than the one found in Overdose, and even in moments where you find it doing weird stuff similar to that game, you can always just snap it back into the action by aiming down with LB. Your coffin has a bunch of new moves now, you have a 3-hit combo with different finishers depending on which face button you press as your third input, you now have the ability to grapple people with your coffin by shooting a chain out of it like Scorpion, this has a few options to it too. It can bring small enemies to you by tapping RB, it can bring you to them by holding RB, this happens no matter what if it's a large or specialty enemy, so be careful and try not to use it over large gaps or you'll end up like me. Enemies now have a dizzy state where you can finish them off, which increases your art score along with giving you some shield back. I want to make note that the finisher is called Rip, the Raging Immortal Punisher, which I think is just the coolest shit ever. If your enemies are dizzy at a distance, you can use your coffin's chain to either pull them to you for a fatality or do a lunging finisher. If the enemy isn't staggered, you'll take small ones as a human shield with two different finishers on triangle and circle. Trying to do these abilities in a crowd can be kind of annoying, but the game is overall pretty good at figuring out when you want to actually take someone as a human shield versus picking a dizzied enemy out of the background to execute. For some reason on release, only your neutral coffin spin can send missiles back. Despite Overdose, the game that introduced this mechanic allowing you to use any melee attack to do this. This is what adds to that unfortunate clunky and jank feeling of the gameplay. The first patch did address this by now allowing you to use any melee attack to send missiles back, even if their active parry frames are way less compared to the neutral coffin spin, which makes them and their timing feel kind of awkward to the flow of gameplay. There is a plethora of demolition shots in this game which can be bought from the new shop that is available between each level. Some of the demolition shots have been fixed and improved from Gungrave Overdose, which makes them more desirable to actually use, like this one which now locks onto enemies where in Overdose they just shot in a cone in front of you and could easily miss them. Some of the demolition shots have horrible hit feedback, like the minigun where enemies don't even react to it, so I ended up ignoring them. You now have a rage mode which increases your damage at the cost of a demolition shot charge, while I really like this new feature, for some reason the meter to gain more demolition shots does not fill while in this mode, so it often felt like the worst option because in the latter half of the game, which I plan to get more in depth than later, requires you to abuse the shit out of AoE and invincibility frames from demolition shots. Unfortunately, I didn't get to use all the demolition shots in my first playthrough, and that is because one of my biggest complaints with the game, perk bloat. I've made it very clear on my channel that I hate progression systems, but I am willing to tolerate them when it actually gives you new moves to to unlock, like demolition shots or the regular combat abilities. Where it completely loses me is stuff like the middle tab of the shop in this game, because it is all filler. The game would be better off without it just giving you all those abilities from the get-go. I know part of what I'm about to say is tied to the infamous skill issue, but the amount of points you get is simply not enough to get everything without mindless grinding of the shortest, most optimal levels. Sure, if I was getting all A or S ranks, which I wasn't when playing a less balanced version of this game that people playing it after this video will never experience, it realistically only would have made a small difference. You are pulled in too many directions because while you want to unlock new moves and demolition shots to modify your gameplay, you have an entire stat boost menu to raise things you really can't perceive the difference. There are also a bunch of moves tied behind certain tiers of some of these stat upgrades. Most of these stat upgrades should have been given to you either as natural progression as you made your way through the game, like health and demolition shots as it was in the original, or things should have been simply given to you at the start 
start, like the range for your bullets. Why is this something that you need to buy? This progression system adds to the roller coaster difficulty of this game, where it initially feels like I am playing the original game again, and then boom, next level it feels like I'm playing something right out of Gungrave Overdose. This is kind of hard to analyze now with the balance patch and actually having upgrades. A fresh save won't play exactly like my first playthrough, so I can't really tell if this was just simply because I didn't know the game that well and this was a learning experience, and actually having knowledge going back now makes these levels much easier. Originally, I had a long written out section about how a bunch of the enemies I found are absolutely infuriating, and how they are the main reason the game ping pongs between the feeling of the original and Overdose, some enemies even being directly brought over from Overdose, but the balance patch changed a lot of facets about them that does alleviate their irritation. So this next section is going to be morphed into what they were like versus what they are now. All of the changes across the board are for the better in my opinion. The enemy that pissed me off the most in the original version of this game was the Riot Shielder. You either had to break their shield with a melee combo, have them get hit with an explosive, or hit the shield with a charge shot. The game's environments and your charge shots have some really weird and bad hitboxes, so there were plenty of times where I was clearly hitting them, but the charge shot went right into an invisible wall and led me to taking a bunch of damage, and overall broke the smooth flow of combat. Your charge shots and melee combos can get interrupted by the tiniest of things, pretty much every basic enemy can trip you up, and the slightest stagger makes you lose your charge. The patch did make it so your melee combos can't be interrupted, which is a godsend. The game does not make this clear at all, at least from what I saw, but some moves, like the triangle finisher for your human shield, breaks enemy riot shields, and the patch made it so the slam does damage in a 360 degree radius around you, instead of just right in front of you, so it makes it actually even easier to break the shield. Demolition shots post-patch also now break the shields. The shields break in two melee attacks post-patch instead of three as it was in the original version. Your guns in rage mode now instantly melt the shield with one burst of bullets. In one patch, this enemy went from being the biggest cock blocker to fun to just being another one in the lineup. For the rest of the enemies I am about to mention, it's important to note going in that a major factor that made them so annoying was their aggression and the lack of breathing room they gave you. All of them have been nerfed, so now they reasonably attack you so you can actually move instead of having mini gunners return from overdose that melt your shields and never run out of ammo, so once you enter their line of sight, they never stop shooting. There's also the gas grenaders that would somehow carry an entire warehouse worth of ammo that would fill the whole level with green fart miasma so you couldn't see where you're going and are constantly taking damage. There's also the rocket launcher enemies that didn't stop firing so you would have to sit still while a conga line of no joke 20 missiles would fly at you that you would need to deflect back at them until they died or else they would infinitely fire and if any of them hit you, you would get stun locked on the ground until you died. Now the rocket launchers only fire a new rocket or four in the case of the specialty enemy once their previous one detonates. The amount of bullshit and particle effects thrown at you in the 1.0 version of this game is comical at points. If you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen a video I posted about some of the encounters in this game. At certain points in certain levels, the floodgates open and the game turns into a CPU killer doom wad from 1997, where they throw as many enemies at you before the game starts to lag. You'll enter an area and suddenly a hundred dudes spawn out of thin air or burst out of the walls. Some of these are absolutely absurd, but when you get into the rhythm of things, they are, to the game's credit, very fun to power fantasy your way through mowing all of these guys down. It's only when the game catches you off guard without the storm barrage or those nightmare scenarios of unrelenting attacks like I've talked about is where the game really starts to test your patience. The sniper enemies seem to have been made to fire less as they have a two second delay between shots. At least I think this is who the patch is referring to with laser shooting enemies. But they're extremely high damage and the fact that even with distance upgrades, they are often way too far out of your reach, they end up still being a real ball buster, especially in levels with large open arenas and with a shit ton of enemies bum rushing you so it's not like you could just ignore them to get to the snipers first. The last major change brought by the patch is the redesign of two levels. Apparently I was the only person on the planet who did not have an issue with the train level. I did run into a now patched out glitch by complete accident that made it so I didn't die when holding a human shield and hitting the tunnel's ceiling, but every post I've seen both online and general discussion and in response to my posts about this game talk about how shit this level is. So to mitigate its annoyance, they removed the landmines on the roof of the train, they removed the jumping hazards, and seem to have made the train's length overall shorter so there is less ground you need to cover before you get to the insta-kill. The platforming in this game, the three times it shows up, is bad and awkward because of how stiff the characters and their jumps are. So to remedy this, in Quartz's level they just laid down a bunch of planks so she could walk 
walk right across it and you didn't have to deal with it at all. If only they made her actually fun to play. The worst of the platforming segments in this game they sadly did not seem to touch at all, and that is this bullshit in the cave in Vietnam. It feels like a level from a game that plays completely differently from how Grave moves, and the collision on these boxes just makes this an utter nightmare as you crash into invisible boundaries of these shipping containers and fall, requiring you to sit and wait around and do this all over again. Not to mention that there's also rocket launcher enemies that fire at you, which will push you off this, and again, make you have to wait for these shipping containers to move back into place again. You can't even safely walk from one end of the shipping container to the other without it trying to push you off with an invisible wall. Since writing this segment, they seem to have also made two other minor adjustments to two other levels. The first one is level 6, where you are no longer on a timer to get to Mika before her team is overrun and everybody is killed. The second one is in Mission 27. In the original version of this game, there were multiple laser grids you had to sneak past in order to get to the boss of the level. If you touched any of these lasers, it would instantly kill you. The first patch made it so they no longer did that, but it seems since then one of the other two patches has completely removed them entirely. There are possibly even more minor changes to levels, but these are the only two that I've noticed. Now I want to talk about some things that realistically can't be patched out of this game. <laughs> no matter how many times I come back and add things to the script, they keep adding stuff to this game. As of the second patch of this game, which when I originally wrote this was the latest patch, they added a new cell shaded mode to the game. And honestly, it does not negate what I'm about to say about this after we cut back into the original script. It looks like they took all of the game's textures and put a Photoshop filter over it. They slapped this shit into Premiere and put the posterize effect on it. I don't even know if you can really consider this cell shaded. I get that they're trying to make it look closer to the original game, but as is, it just looks like a deep fried shit post. It doesn't make the game look any better. It often makes it look worse in a lot of places. All of these assets were clearly not made with this in mind, and while it may look better in some places, and it is cool that they added this in in general, it realistically doesn't help this game's visual issues more than just being a band-aid that's covered in salt. The art direction of Gungrave Gore leaves a lot to be desired. I feel bad saying this, but compared to the original, it's very bland. It feels like Nintendo hired this man to your Unreal Engine store-bought assets, especially some of the monsters. All of them feel like they were ripped from something else. They remind me of some shit in a game Mandalore would cover that was an early access open world survival crafting game that would eventually die before ever being completed and was probably a scam. I would not say Gungrave Gore looks bad, but it does look really generic and forgettable. Just generic looking factories, neon city streets, jungles, and caves. Even the final level alien section that is a complete departure from the aesthetics of the rest of the game falls pretty flat. The only thing of note about this area is these floor textures remind me of the ones used for the pack-a-punch guns in Call of Duty Zombies. Sadly, nothing has yet topped the original's complete departure and tone shift in the final level. The only aesthetically pleasing thing for me in this game is the HUD. I love this big goofy skull. I am so happy they did not go with some shit minimalist HUD like so many games do now. This shit right here is soulless, and if Gungrave Gore has anything, it certainly has soul. The overall presentation of this game isn't all that stellar. Most of the cutscenes look like some Unreal Engine 3 machinimas made in 2013 by Kutra. The depth of field was flickering in a bunch in my playthrough, and often struggled to wrap around characters, especially their hair. The lighting was often incredibly unflattering to Grave, especially in level intros. The pre-rendered cutscenes look incredible, but they're sadly few and far between. The game is riddled with sound issues. It often felt like I was missing half of the sounds the game should have been playing at any given time. Time. Graves' guns have a nice impact to them from the first game, but plenty of other things are either weirdly limp, super quiet, or have no sound at all. For example, your triple circle melee combo finisher has basically no sound. <laughs> Same goes for your coffin chain grab. Ah, <laughs> your coffin finisher. Enemy weapons sound like pea shooters or make no sound at all like the shotgunners. Or the chainsaws that make no sound when they stab into you when they do their grab move. 
It often sounds like all of the weapons share the same handful of shitty sound library effects, even when it wouldn't make sense, so the foam nerf bat swords make the same sound as the pistols or the shotguns. I played the PS5 version of this game, so sound effects played through the controller's speakers, which is cute and does enhance the experience to some extent, but the sound often didn't play or randomly did when it shouldn't have. I can't imagine what playing this game sounds like on a PC or Xbox. The already lacking soundscape must be even worse and weirdly barren compared to what I experienced. Like sometimes the sound cues for parrying rockets wouldn't play through my speaker and it felt super limp, so it must be even worse if they don't compensate for this in the other versions. If you don't like this setting, there is sadly no way to turn it off from what I saw within the game. Maybe there's something in the system side of things on the PlayStation 5, but the game does not give you an option other than to turn off the radio, which I did because I am not making the same mistake I did in Overdose after having a single level of quartz squawking in my ears every two seconds over this shitty speaker. This sadly does not stop her from doing this every time you die, though. Because of all of the sound issues, it makes the game feel incomplete, especially cutscenes. You can pick any action-based cutscene out of a hat, and there is a good chance there is going to be something slightly off about it. Usually explosions are weirdly quiet or completely absent. The worst being the final one where you and Zell deal the final blow to the big bad of the game. The transformation sound effects of the coffin feel weirdly out of place. Personally, I would have made it sound different, something more aggressive and loud, like Bay Transformer sound effects. The charging of their shots is non-existent, despite there being visual indications that there probably should be. The sound of them firing was so muffled and quiet that on my TV I couldn't hear them and thought there was no sound effect until I watched it back on my PC. The shots hitting who knows who, yes, that is his name, and their corresponding explosions actually have no sound effect. Zell's jacket ruffling is probably the loudest thing in this cutscene, and that should not be the case. The music is also something that is way quieter than it should be. The music selection is honestly pretty bizarre as well. The game has a bunch of great tracks, and then there's also a ton of levels filled with music that you would expect as a Guilty Gear lobby track, or main menu music in another game. Maybe it's unreasonable to say, but I do think shuffling the music around would do this game a big favor so tons of levels wouldn't feel like it's filled with things you'd expect on a lo-fi to kill bad guys to playlist. I don't want them to make new stuff, just replace levels filled with the music I played in the example a minute ago. Before moving on to talking about the end of the game, there are a few things I want to talk about that I don't know how to flow into naturally. Like with Gungrave Overdose, Grave isn't the only playable character in this game, but unlike Rocket Billy and Junji, these characters are limited to specific levels. Quartz is the new character that I mentioned talks to you over the radio. Her combat is focused around melee attacks, with her ranged weapon freezing enemies in place so you can hit them. Thankfully, you only have to play a single level as her, because I find her gameplay painfully boring. Her combat is so stiff and repetitive. The fact you can't turn off sound effects coming through the controller speaker leaves such a grating sound effect constantly playing anytime you are fighting. This sound is nails on a chalkboard for me. Boom. 
Bungie is the other playable character, and he plays leagues better than Quartz. Again, this was another section that had some pretty fair complaints about his gameplay, like wishing he had more tools to mess around with, and only being able to play him in his dedicated single level and a set piece in the final level. In the third patch that came out on January 27th, it addressed all of my issues, so I'm back again to rewriting this script. As annoying as that is for me, I really want to commend Iggy Mob because their patches have been dead on addressing issues people have with the game and making it a vastly better product. As much as I wish the game came out like this, it's very cool to see the devs continue to support this game and take it in the right direction. It only makes the game easier to recommend and all the more lovable. The new features added in the Bungie update include a charge shot, a dodge shot, a jump shot, a new backdash animation, a new demolition shot, and some other upgrades. Unfortunately, they aren't moves, but instead the same filler crap I've already complained about with Grave, like the range and damage increase. You already have to pay 30k points to unlock him in the first place, which I think is not only way too high, but dumb to begin with. Just make it a reward for completing your first playthrough, because now not only do you have to grind a million points for Grave, but also another million for Bungie. If you are someone like me who planned to play him while trying to beat the game on Gord difficulty to unlock Brandon Heat, then you just have an underpowered character compared to Grave in an unforgiving difficulty. I already got a taste of what that was going to be like on Hard, where I had to play him at the set piece at the end of the game, and I was stuck there for 30 minutes as I could not deal any damage to these ogre men, and just had to spam demolition shots over and over again so I wouldn't die. Even in the original version of this game, he was still incredibly fun to play within his single level with his basic options. He's much more nimble than Grave as he has a unique dash mechanic when going into burst mode. It's unfortunate that I can't completely praise him with no caveats thanks to the intrusive progression. Despite overall liking this game, the last bit of it is easily my least favorite part, because it feels less like the original game like the early levels did, and more so like Ungrave Overdose. A bunch of these final combat arenas throw the most annoying, tanky enemies at you with such ridiculous numbers that you are pretty much required to abuse the iframes of demolition shots in order to survive and regain HP. In conjunction with the hordes of foes, they pepper the sniper enemies in areas that it's hard to reach them even with the level 4 distance upgrade. Again, like with Overdose, it really stretched the runtime longer than it needed to be for how simple the gameplay loop is. There are probably a handful of levels you could just outright remove and it wouldn't make that much of a difference because they are already bleeding together in my mind due to how samey and generic they are. Or alternatively, you could cut down a bunch of levels in half because so much of it is just the same hallways over and over again. Bosses have never been this series' strong suit, but the ones present in the final few levels prevent me from wanting to go back and playing this game on gore difficulty, where if I die, I restart the level. They play like shitty Dark Souls bosses with massive AoE attacks I need to dodge. Designed for a game with a better dodge roll, your roll does not have enough iframes and is so stiff while their attacks track you and have the most disjointed, unclear hitboxes that sometimes you dodge and it looks like you should be fine only to be hit anyways, and then other times I manage to dodge perfectly and I have no clue why when it looked visually no different from when I got hit. Even after the patches that attempted to address them, they are all still super inconsistent. Like I mentioned earlier, it's hard for me to compare how some of the balance stacks up post-patch, because there are just too many variables and no access to the original version. For good measure, I did stream replaying the whole game on hard post the third patch, and basically brute forced my way through all the fights that got on my nerves. So I can't really say if I got better, the upgrades made that much of a difference, or did the patches actually tone them down. Taranti still can one-shot you faster than you can react, all of the main villain bosses still can catch you off guard with absurd damage out of nowhere, so I still don't really want to go back and do a third full playthrough on gore difficulty. The one thing that I can say for sure is that the coffin you get for beating the game on normal that makes it so you stack demolition shots faster definitely makes abusing iframes even easier. I hope they don't end up nerfing this or patching it out. A few of the other bosses are just guys from the first game, but they are completely different. The only thing this guy and Bear Walkins have in common is their name. To end this video off, I want to list some of the things that I think this game could still use in a fourth patch. The devs have been good so far addressing criticisms of this game, and if they by chance see this, I hope that some of this makes it into the game, or at very least puts them in the right direction to changing aspects of it. The biggest change that would be in this game's favor is either adding more points as mission complete rewards, or lowering the cost of upgrades in the store, possibly even doing both. After doing two full playthroughs and grinding one of the shortest 
levels at least 10 plus times, I still don't have everything unlocked for Grave. I don't even know how long it would take to get everything, and now it's going to take even longer because Bungie has the same upgrades of his own now. Not to mention that you already have to pay 30k to even unlock him, which I think should have just been a post-game unlock. Ideally, the whole stat upgrade menu that is in the middle of the store would just be removed from the game and just given to you from the get-go, but I know that is an unreasonable demand. It would vastly help the appeal of replaying this game if you unlock things from lower difficulties when beating higher ones. For example, if I beat this game on hard first, please give me the original game's costume, which is this difficulty's reward, along with the power up coffin and the guns for beating it on normal and easy. As much as I like this game, I don't really want to go back and play another 31 mission playthrough on easy after beating it on normal and hard, just so I can get the powered up guns. The game is honestly already wearing out its welcome by the end, a few too many levels for its own good. I do not want to have to play 124 missions to get all the cool things you added to this game as unlocks. The next biggest fix is everything related to the sound of this game. This is the thing that almost all players are going to interact with and experience when playing it. It really does take you out of the moment in cutscenes when the sound and the mixing is so off. That's not even mentioning when it happens in gameplay. Either add more sound effects to the game if they are missing, or fix the bugs that are preventing them from playing if they are actually in the game, and I just ended up having a bugged experience. Please also add a setting to stop sounds coming from the controller's speaker. I may like it, but if a player doesn't, they are just stuck with it. Please add fully remappable controls. Controls. I hate to come off like a dick, but this really should just be a basic feature in every game. Games should not be allowed to be released and charge money for themselves without this bare minimum function. Beyond being for someone like myself who just wants to move fire from RT to square, it is something that greatly helps players with disabilities. Please adjust the beat score ratings and post mission screens. Getting an S rating feels impossible, especially when I get a 1200 plus combo score only to manage to barely crack A. Maybe make Make it so demo shots add to your beat counter instead of just keeping the combo going. It's the only real way I could think of helping you reach such high numbers without just spamming the roll storm barrage attack over and over again like I did in my second playthrough. Please also increase the beat combo time. As is, it quickly drops even when locked in basic animations, and so many levels have fake hallways and rooms with dead ends with nothing to break but have enemies you have to kill in them, along with it not being very clear what is actually breakable in most levels, and what is breakable isn't even consistent between them. For example, I cannot break this yellow generator in the cave level of Vietnam, yet it explodes in a single burst a few levels later. So many levels have narrow hallways and doors that you have to stand in front of waiting for them to open that there isn't enough stuff in the environment to keep it going. The alien levels have barely anything or nothing at all in some cases to keep your combo going, so I have zero clue how you were supposed to get an S in these. I'm not sure if this is how it always worked, was changed to be this way in a patch, or is simply a bug, but please make it so if you do a demolition shot in rage mode it doesn't instantly turn it off. If you want to keep it this way, maybe make it so the demolition shot does more damage or has extra visual flair when in rage. Please give the ability to change demolition shots mid-mission, either by cycling through each of the four D-pad directions, put them on a weapon wheel that when open either slows or pauses the game, or simply in the pause menu like it was in the original. There are so many demolition shots in this game that being limited to four feels really restrictive and just results in some of the less straightforward applications ending up being ignored. Unless you memorize every single level and every encounter that they have within them, you may run into situations where demolition shots you didn't take have better applications and uses than the ones you have now, but there's no way to swap them unless you restart the level, which the trade-off of losing all of your progress doesn't outweigh trying to do cool things within the levels. The game has so many cool demolition shots, but it feels like it does not give you the opportunity to use them to the fullest. This is easily the most negligible on the list, but possibly rework the new camera angles added to the Executioner's Blood demolition shot. Besides the fact I find that it often obscures what you are doing compared to how it used to be, it often freaks out when you are too close to enemies and things in the environment. Possibly give us the ability to toggle the extra cinematic angles for each demolition shot individually, because I wouldn't want to turn them off wholesale just for this, because a lot of the other ones added in the patches, like the 360 degree camera on the Raging Inferno, look great. And that's everything I can think of, I'll leave this list as a TLDR on the screen now. Even when it was only the original release version of this game, I still planned to recommend it, and as I 
I've said multiple times throughout this video, the patches have only made it a better and more worthwhile experience. This game may be jank and lopsided in areas, but I am really happy it exists and that I was able to play it. If you really like the first game, definitely check this out. It's leagues better than Overdose. It's available on Game Pass, so give it a whirl if you have a sub. If you've made it this far into the video, I just want to say thanks for watching as always. If you really liked the video, please leave a like and comment, and don't forget to subscribe and pass the video around. If you really like these videos and want to see more like it, then maybe consider becoming a patron on Patreon. It is the best way to support the channel. All patrons get access to videos a day early, along with a $7 tier that allows you to view rough cuts of upcoming videos. I'm now going to shout out all of my $5 and up patrons who really help support the channel. Bully, Densha, Lucy the Fox, Salt and Sweet Rum, Sir Newt Newt, Scary Dinosaur, Curtis Harris, Elliot Morton, Kohai Carmen, Lotto, Medi Not the Bad Guy, Nemphy, Quaner, Quartz, Samuel Egan, Saiyan Heggy, Simply Aiden, Slemp Tingle, Swimming, Walkman, BBF and Bloxburg, NM, Revan, Cosmonaut Cola, Rovit, Ben Johnson, Buckets, Bergnut, Chichometrius, Cursed Void RTGC, Ekfrazo, Filthy Finger 69, Fishkami, Hardleg Joe, Kazmark Chick, Kevin Velasquez, Lazy Titan, Megan, Nick Nicholas Pedinato, Jordan Bennett, Sean the Berserker Fighter, Starcasters, The Worstest Guy, Apple Juice 426, William Moore, and David Roberts. Thanks so much, guys. As for what's coming out next, I'm not really sure. I have a ton of videos still in the middle of production, things of varying degree of completion. I'm also slowly chipping away at Armored Core, but who knows whenever that's going to be out because there's 15 games I have to cover, I think. So if you really want to help support me as videos take really long to make, then the Patreon really helps out. I also have a NordVPN affiliate link in the description below using my promo code, and I also have a TCG Player affiliate link in the description below. Any purchases you make while checking out using that link will give me a small kickback. And I think that's pretty much it. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and as always, thanks for watching.